everybody. So welcome back to another community call uh, for Research Hub, where today we want to start out talking about tokenomics. Um, we've gotten a lot of feedback saying that like the basically utility use case for research coin is minimal, you know, uh, at the least. And we probably need to start thinking about ways to help increase like the reason to own a uh, research coin and then also providing more velocity syncs within the application itself. So um, kind of the plan is we want to spend about a month brainstorming potential uh, tokenomic features to build into Research Hub. And then once we feel good as a community of one or two of these different features, uh, we'll run them past some kind of like tokenomics expert to try and refine it and then potentially build it into Research Hub. So uh, a couple of people on this call attended a call earlier today uh, about the tokenomics, but I kind of wanted to open it up to the entire community if people were interested. Um, so anyway, anyone here or listening, if you have any like uh, thoughts on different like tokenomic features uh, for Research Hub to build, feel free to add them to the spreadsheet I'm about to share. I'll put it under the Discord and uh, Slack groups as well. Um, so that way people can go ahead and play around with this document. Um, yeah, so the idea here is that we'd like to list out um, all the different like tokenomic features that our community can come up with and then uh, curate them to the top one or two over the next like uh, two to four weeks or so. Um, just as like a abbreviated kind of example uh, of the discussion we had earlier today, um, I'll go over kind of our three top options that we listed. Uh, the first one is um, changing the role of the submitter. So in theory, right now, the submitter of a paper on Research Hub earns a significant amount of the research coin rewards uh, without really doing a whole lot. They basically just post the paper. So the idea here is that the submitter role would be turned into kind of like a, a museum curator for specific papers. Um, here, the curator would be eligible to receive a certain proportion of all of the rewards on a paper. And this curator, their job is to essentially drive attention to a given paper. So either getting their friends to come into Research Hub and upvote it, or attracting a uh, scientist to the paper to add their commentary to have like a robust discussion around the paper. The idea is the curator ends up being incentivized to do this because they earn a certain proportion of all of the research coin rewards uh, that are given to the paper and the discussion around the paper. Um, one important piece of this, and the details aren't totally figured out, is that um, anyone could become the curator by staking uh, RSC on the paper. So if I submitted a paper, I would initially be the curator. But if Edwin thought he could do a better job of attracting conversation to the paper, he could stake 100 RSC on it and replace me. And I would have to stake 101 RSC in order to get the curator role back. Um, the idea here is that you can create a velocity sync for research coin by asking people to stake their tokens um, and earn a portion of the rewards for any given paper. Um, again, this is kind of like an early idea, but that's sort of the overall um, concept. I guess, Jeff, since you're here, do you want to give like a quick explanation of your um, voting escrow RSC idea? Yeah, definitely. Can you guys hear me just fine? I know these headphones are crazy. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I actually made a um, like a kind of public post about it. I posted actually on on Research Hub about this a few months ago, but um, the I, and I can post a link to that um, doc or to that uh, post. But the idea here is um, so there's a system called Vote Escrow system. It's very kind of more com getting more and more common in the DeFi world. So you essentially um, kind of the weight of your vote or how many um, coins you would earn would be contingent upon um, how many tokens you stake. And then the second parameter is how long you're willing to stake them for. So when you say you have research coin and you stake it for, um, you know, you have a million research coin, you stake it for four years, uh, you should have more voting rights and you should earn or reap more rewards than somebody who takes their million and only locks it in for one year. Um, so with this idea, you can take your research coin and you can lock it in and you'll get VE research coin. And the VE research coin will be your weighting in how you can direct um, funding to different grants and different micro, uh, micro grants and proposals. Um, so the idea here is if anyone's familiar with Curve Finance, you have um, 
you'll have people like uh, submitting proposals for different projects they want to do. And we'll have, say, some budget, quarterly budget, and you can earn this via maybe something like donations or via um, uh, like putting money into DeFi protocols and earning yield off of it. And the yield that's earned can be shunted into funding these grants. Um, and as a VERSC holder, you control uh, and direct where those grants are, which grants get funded. Um, and so we'd have to build out like some things on the, on the website for it. But um, in return, the VERSC holder can, for example, earn um, kind of a percentage of profits uh, that the lab they funded, say the lab they funded publishes on Research Hub and they earn a bunch of RSC from that. Um, you as a person who directed the funding to them would earn some percentage of that. And there's things we could thread in with like IP and license, licensing of IP and percentage ownership of that. So uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the gist of it. I had one question about this whole thing. Uh, so yep. let's say I'm the Gates Foundation and I buy a million RSC or whatever the, the number is. And I would like to fund research, but I also would like to take advantage of the expertise that's on the platform. Um, so I would basically like somebody to be able to, uh, someone who's demonstrated enough expertise to be able to use my VERSC to actually vote for some of the grants. If they're not transferable, that could be a bit of an issue, right? And we're making them not transferable so that, you know, there can't be speculation on them. But I'm, I'm just wondering about a way to, you know, not like, I don't want to say de like temporarily delegate voting power so that the whales can actually take advantage of the decentralization of the platform. Yeah, that's actually, that's a really good point. And uh, in the Curve Finance ecosystem, there's actually um, something similar to that that's happening where um, this other protocol called Convex is people can actually send their CRV to Convex and they lock it as VE um, CRV. Mm -hmm. um, and so we could have something like that um, kind of an extra layer where if you're a user, uh, you don't, you can send your stuff to a delegated person and the delegate can maybe give you some RSC in, in return or some bonus RSC or the right for them to have more VERSC to delegate. Yeah, that makes reputation really valuable there because that's going to be how you determine, you know, who gets to vote what. So yeah. A clear monetary premium on, re on reputation, I'd say. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah, because then you people will trust you more to uh, be the person to delegate. It's a great idea, Edwin. It kind of reminds me of like syndicates on AngelList where you can yeah. have like a single person, you know, allocate funding for others. It's a really good idea. And so I guess the last one here, um, Ricardo, if you're here, do you want to give like a quick overview of your thought on the research of roles? Yeah, so this is just a, you know, first idea on how we could, you know, potentially, you know, all of us uh, users of um, Research Hub have, you know, some somewhat say skin in the game when it comes to the research coin itself and so that's basically a way to kind of like have roles that are defined by a minimum amount of rsc that you're holding uh you know in your you know wallet, for example or in, your, in your account so uh we had a a wave of spammers uh i think a couple couple months ago and it was difficult to kind of like you know um identify who was uh, legit who was not so something that we were thinking about was, you know, verifying users. So an idea could be, you know, you you get verified by someone from 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 the research hub team, and you have a minimum, you know, like a thousand, ten thousand RSC in your wallet, and you get the verified badge uh, for your holding. And same applies basically for people that want to do peer review and editors. Uh, as we also discussed today, where we're not trying to put a financial barrier to this so there might be way to implement solutions that you know do not cause problems to to people that have you know uh difficulty in raising uh money to to basically get those rsc so for example we could get some of these rsc let's say vested until you actually earn that amount and then kind of like unlock uh you know the the, the full amount so this is just an initial idea but uh, yeah, the idea would be basically that each user that is not a transitory user 
we would like to have some RSC in his in his wallet uh, if he wants to belong to the to the community. That's 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 the main idea behind it. Yeah, I think there's also a lot of stuff we could do here. Um, Kobe is thinking about like a business model around like a like a freemium style product, kind of like a LinkedIn premium, um, where we could do something similar with Research Hub. If you like stake X tokens, you get some added like analytics to know who's clicking on your profile, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I guess kind of the point of this is to bring awareness towards the fact that um, we're starting to rethink some of the tokenomics for Research Hub. And if anybody out there has like different ideas that they'd like us to consider, um, add them to this tokenomics brainstorming sheet and we'll discuss them um, a week from today, next Monday at, I believe it's uh, 8 a.m. Pacific time. Um, I'll add more information under the um, uh, Slack posts for this chat too. So yeah, if anybody has any ideas, feel free to add them into the sheet. Uh, Sapik? Uh, I had a question about the curator part, uh, the curator idea. I mean, uh, do we have any specific use case in mind wherein some person would want to be the curator of a post? Because I'm not really sure uh, why would somebody want to do that? Like, right. And for multiple posts. So if you could just give some light on that. We would change the reward scheme. So that way the curator earned like a certain proportion of all of the tokens given to a post. So right now the submitter earns, I think it's like 20%, it's either 10 or 20% of the RSC um, that's given to a post via upvotes. So here we would remove that reward and give it to a curator um, where the curator basically earns a portion of all of the RSC earned by a post. So it's a way to like invest in the future success of a post. If you thought like a post was gonna generate a lot of upvotes and a lot of discussion, you could stake tokens to be the curator in order to get like a certain portion of like those upvotes for the paper and discussion. Does that make sense? Yeah. And this is, this is all just, brainstormed so no idea if it's viable or, or if people would even want to do that so yeah the, the more criticism the better so that way we can like kind of um, iron out any wrinkles cool yeah any last thoughts on uh tokenomics before we move on again another discussion uh next monday when we'll kind of narrow it down even more um i mentioned this to jeff and ricardo but you know um we're talking about what to do, especially when we're bringing on 500 editors, about how to make sure there's not too much cell pressure. And I was saying, potentially setting something up where um, they get the tokens, but they can only unlock the tokens based on metrics that we believe indicate that there's enough liquidity in the system to absorb the cell pressure. Um, and Ideally, those metrics would be related to activities that they actually have control of. Now, I'm not sure exactly what they would be, but I think that'd be the most direct way to make sure that the editors are incentivized um, while making sure it doesn't affect the ecosystem too much. Um, and um, yeah, and one of the questions, um, one of the issues I was thinking about, and I'm, I'm kind of up in the air about this one, but if we pursued that path also you would have to think about short versus long-term compensation and the psychology behind that and how we want to balance it so so just to repeat back in theory like uh you're suggesting for editor compensation that there should be some kind of like mandatory lockup that's tied to like the marketplace dynamics of research coin yeah, yeah similar to what ricardo <clears throat> mentioned but it's just like because it can't be indefinite, right? But and it also can't be on a timed, a specific, because we don't know what the growth trajectory is going to look like. So that's a huge gamble, essentially. So it has to be based on growth metrics. And ideally, those growth metrics should be tied to editor activity. I'm not sure exactly what that looks like, but I think getting more people thinking about that will be useful. Yeah, so I like the idea of having like a portion of it tied to like North Star metric growth. So just like organic users within a person's hub 
like I think that there's something there. It's kind of complicated though because a hub that has like five people in it versus a hub that has 500, it's hard to right. make things totally even. Um, right. But I, d I really like the idea of having a portion of the compensation, well, even unlocking it's better than having the compensation itself tied to it, like an unlock uh, that's associated with organic weekly active contributor growth. The marketplace one I think is trickier because like the legal side of that I think is tough. I think the DAO could vote for something if Research Hub Inc. isn't involved whatsoever. But um, I, I don't love having it tied to the marketplace, but tied to organic. Wait, company. marketplace? I don't understand. You said liquidity initially, like to make oh, sure. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think adjacent indicators of liquidity are probably optimal. Totally. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. Like yeah. more more adoption, you know, like stepwise yeah. release of coins. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not going to take that much for the speculative premium to really add up, right? So we just have to... Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, just like thinking practically, Edwin, if you have like a suggestion, um, if, if you wanted to write up like a quick Google Doc, like we could discuss it at the next community call, just to like okay. throw, throw the idea out there in a little more um, formal of a way. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, any other thoughts on tokenomics before we move on? Just a little one actually based off of what Edwin said. I wonder if like, um, just on a side note, if we should, create like a an area so um having governance like be kind of open-ended to everybody causes a bunch of spam that occurs on snapshot so i've seen that with a few other DAOs. so that's why we've like filtered it to have like only a select few people be able to actually upload a formal vote on there but i wonder would you guys like to have like a location where you can like the community can pitch ideas so instead of just like drafting up a google doc there's like a central location mm -hmm. we can have open discourse about that and then just a select few people can put it on snapshot but at least you're putting it out there into the world for everyone to see is that something you guys would be interested in definitely yeah so we, we currently have the the thread the possibility to open thread when you when you announce the rip one rip two or three on discord right so basically creating a channel or you want that or you think in discord yeah i was thinking something like discord and then um opening up the ability to make thread to like everybody and then um yeah i just want to make sure that like it's something that the community would want um so we can like implement that and then make it clear that everyone can do that and it seems like malik also said yeah so that's something that i can also kind of make a comment on uh publicly I mean, couldn't we just have like a discourse.researchhub.com section of the website where people can people already have uh, accounts and they can basically post threads and things like that? It, it wouldn't need to be like a separate. It would just be like a section on the website. There, I think there are other. I'm going to. Uh, here's one that I think is pretty good. And I think it'd be pretty easy for us to add something like that there. Hmm. Tracer, yeah. Most people use Discourse for this kind of thing, right? Yeah. Um, we're already pretty like spread out between like Slack and uh, Discord, though. So yeah, I think Jeff, whatever whatever you think is the best way to get the most engagement, whether that's Discord, Discourse, or whatever. It's just okay. that yeah, Slack and Discord are not optimal for like what he's talked like laying out a really detailed argument about proposal and having people vote. It's not a good framework. Yeah, I could I can maybe I can talk with Edwin and we can we can iron out what's the best thing here. Yeah. Yeah, whatever you guys want to do, we can make it happen. Cool. Um yeah, so so any more thoughts on tokenomics? I was thinking if there's there could be something that we could do in terms of the editor turnaround, like when we got new editors, if there's something that editors could kind of like uh I don't know, like decided to get some of their kind of like stipend in, in invested tokens for instead of, you know, liquid tokens for additional benefits. I think there could be something there, given that, you know, there's a lot of people that would potentially like to be editors. Then we could also value other things apart from, you know, the scientific background, also value the alignment uh, with the community and kind of like favor not really favor people that want to have more lock tokens, but offer the possibility to people that would like to, you know, uh, do, might like to do something like that. 
but uh, again, I just like just came to my mind, so I have to probably think about this a bit more. But I think maybe the editor uh, program could also be be used in this case. Jeff, I know you you mentioned in the chat that um, we don't have an editor call on the schedule. I, I think uh, um, Scott like accidentally deleted it uh, when he was trying to remove himself from it. So I'll add another one to the schedule um, this week. But yeah, maybe during that call we should talk about some of this stuff, like the compensation um, between like soft lockups or like some added vested token or something. Because I know we were thinking about um, tweaking the compensation anyway. So that's probably a good venue to to discuss some of this stuff in. So I'll add that to the calendar after this call. Cool. Um, yeah, so uh, unless anybody has anything else on tokenomics, feel free to jump in. Um, moving on to the next topic is we had a board meeting uh, a little over a week ago. And one of the things we were thinking about is um, starting to put together like a scientific advisory board for Research Hub. So this, in theory, would be like really well established uh, academics or engineers who can help like inform Research Hub's product direction and then also do some of the hand to hand combat to help recruit like super high quality users. Um, I have a couple of people in mind, but I wanted to open it up to everybody um, to kind of like uh, I guess like hear how you all think Research Hub could benefit from a scientific advisory board. And then if there are any specific people that you have in mind that you think would be good candidates. Um, yeah, just opening it up to everybody. George Church. He's, he actually does a lot of advisory stuff and we have a few connections, so he could definitely be on there for sure. I'll write that yeah. down. Yeah, plus one for church. Um, but that, you know, ideally, that's the type, right? You know, scientific, like professor, kind of like you know, scientific, uh, well-established uh, person in the field that also has a little bit of knowledge of like what's going on in Web three and crypto. That would be ideal because we are on that you know kind of like convergence of the two fields where it's not that easy for a scientific person to kind of like fully understand what we're doing and it's definitely not easy for a crypto person to understand what what's going on in the academic in academia so yeah ideally that would be the profile we could probably you know do a little bit of research and uh, draft you know some some names yeah totally um yeah so if anybody like if you come up with any names kind of on your own feel free to send them to me and uh like our our team's kind of evaluating different candidates I guess like one part about this too, which is always tricky is like um, boards can be um, like socially hard because some some people will just sign up for boards and not really do anything. And it's almost like a lending their brand, you know, to put on like a landing page type of thing. And we, we wanna try and avoid that. Like mm. if you bring board members on to Research Hub, like there needs to be something tangible that they're doing aside from like, just lending their identity. So um, like George Church, for instance, is somebody who like has like a really great following, you know, um, among like like the intersection of crypto and like biotechnology, as Ricardo said. So like if we brought on George Church, there could be something where it's like he helps us um, by tweeting, you know, once a month about a paper that he shared to Research Hub or something, some tangible, like, uh, I guess, other side of the arrangement. So yeah with with someone like george church do you think like uh outreach or a anything else specifically edwin you were thinking um yeah i mean i i haven't thought that much but i think the first thing to think about is what do we what do we want right how valuable what's what would be the best thing an advisor could give us right and then credibility, sort of, credibility. So like it's so difficult to credibility can I, it's so difficult in my opinion to get like web3 project into academia you know, it looks sketchy. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but if someone like you know George Church sends you know tweet about us, is like this is you know they're they're doing like a really good job. This is you know some stuff that is really gonna help uh, you know the problems that we're help solving the problems that we're having in academia. So I think credibility is really lo what we're looking for for a scientific. Uh, so is a tweet the best way to demonstrate? Um, maybe not. Maybe. Uh, Actually, probably like even more like kind of like that in-person interaction, kind of like bringing in other people and kind of like giving us credibility in like a more personal way. So I'm pretty sure he knows a lot of like really uh, influential people in academia. 
so maybe not even tweeting but kind of like finding us other other people that could testify what we're doing because i think that really the problem here is that we're lacking that traction given by you know pis and not you know phd students they're more difficult to kind of like really you know certify what we're doing in terms of the credibility of the project so that could be something that could be helpful um, so I, I i don't know i feel like if we had people who actually had labs that could use what we're doing and we convince them to not just get on our board but actually have their labs use our product i think that would be the best um way to get credibility what do you mean by our like right now what i'm thinking is the eln this is something that they could use yeah if we can create like uh, on the eln some shared documents that maybe their phd students can use but then you have to still advertise it otherwise nobody's gonna know so uh well, it's a mix in between the two i think i'm not against tweets right i'm just thinking about <laughs> okay, if we're going to think about the best possible way to do this right something that is like enduring right it would probably be you know if we could get these people to actually use it and like it and tell us how we, they think we can make it better then there's then you get the word of mouth yep. which is the most powerful right so um, this is like incredibly helpful i'm glad the conversation's going in this direction because credibility was sort of like our motivation too like for thinking about putting together a scientific advisory board and yeah like what does that mean like how does someone help increase our credibility um i've written down what we have so far like social media stuff like introductions to other users like actually using the product themselves like what other asks can we have when we approach you know, potential board members when it comes to increasing our credibility, like speaking at conferences, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you could look at H index, like citation rate, that kind of thing. How you know how much they pop up in their field within the past five years in important papers. Okay, cool. Yeah, we can definitely kind of like analyze the candidates based on like uh, academic achievements. Yeah, I think you nailed it, uh, Edwin. Using our product it's probably the best publicity that we can get because that shows that you know it actually works because we you know we encounter bugs so we know there's they're there but once there's actually you know someone that is using that on a daily basis for their their research that is even more valuable information for us so it's a kind of like a, has a like a win-win situation for both um, so that's tough though right because those are those are personal conversations how you get that um i mean yeah. i think like you know, we have to think of, of us, of the people here who have networks that might enable them to have those conversations. You know, that would be the time to, to exploit it. But to get something now where it's just like, okay, you're on our scientific advisory board and, you know, maybe I shoot out a tweet, but to actually like have a conversation with them, lay out the, the you know, research of five years from now, we think there's a lot of value there and here's how you can add value. That's a conversation um and so to think about how to have those conversations um yeah I th I th the role would probably be like a high touch point for me personally yeah. where like we have board meeting with a regular board you know once a quarter so it'd be something similar too and then like you know everybody would have my phone number and i would hop on calls if they needed to do stuff so i think it, it would be like um pretty high touch point uh for like our team to keep people involved And it also shows that we're, you know, helping kind of like bu building a product around, you know, what they want. If they mm -hmm. feel like they're empowered and it's like, okay, so they're actually, you know, changing, you know, the features and so on to kind of like come to kind of like help me in doing what I do day by day. That also shows, you know, a uh, really good effort from our side. So I think, you know, creating those channels, as you said, Edwin, would be crucial, uh, but could be a really good way to actually create that credibility in academia. Should we consider anyone from outside academia for this type of thing? Um, trying to think of like a couple examples. Well, who, who, who are on our regular board of advisors right now? So it's Brian um, Max Hodak, who uh, he uh, co-founded Neuralink. Um, okay. Now he's working on something else. 
and then Rob Reinhardt, who co-founded Soylent, um, like the the uh, drink company. Mm -hmm. This is those three so far. And what do you think the the uh, most valuable things you get from those people are? Perspective. So um, Max is an interesting person who like uh, like he never did a graduate degree within academia. But he's worked, you know, in startups uh, with like extremely accomplished academics. So he has like an awesome perspective of like being familiar with how to relate to super high quality academics while also building a company and a product, you know, that can sustain itself um, via revenues. Like that's a he's, he's got an amazing perspective um, basically on everything we're trying to do. Um, same thing with Rob. Rob's like a, a little bit more of a traditional guy. So he brings like. Um, like he hates computers, for instance. So he brings like a perspective of like, hey, we should, you know, print out an actual journal article and like, you know, have more real world events, like conferences, in person stuff. Um, so if you're trying to bring somebody not on the scientific advisory board, but somebody outside uh, to the board, um, is that what you're trying to do, or just bring somebody outside academia to the scientific advisory board? Which one is it? Yeah, the second one. I'm thinking someone like, and this is obviously not going to work, but like Aaron Schwartz, like someone who's a technologist who has, like, okay. yeah, who's put in effort to um, help open science. Like John Arnold is somebody who, um, like, he was like a exec for Enron, and then like spent all of his uh, money there, like trying to do like open science and open data and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, like non scientists who are involved in science. There's uh, somebody I had talked to, I mentioned this to you a while back, Patrick, his name is Sven. Um, he's from um, Coastal yeah. Ventures. Yeah, so they're like a really big VC fund. Um, and when I talked to him, he was like extremely passionate. Just he's, he even said like, even if there was like no financials involved, like he would just, this is like a passion project type of thing for him. Um, and he, I think was a like um, computational, um, like something computational at Stanford. I think he was a professor there for a good period of time and now he's a you know partner at this vc firm and uh he they have exposure to like um investing in like products like uh, helium was one of the crypto projects that they invested in so he he has some exposure in the crypto world and he's really passionate about like streamlining like kind of um yeah like the kind of like the eln function but like for um kind of coding and stuff like that too and some of the computational stuff so I think somebody like that could be cool too. Kind of has a little bit of both worlds. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Thanks for bringing him back up. I'll, I'll add him to our list of people we're thinking about. Sweet. Uh, Mark? Yeah, this would be, uh, I'm not sure if they are reachable, but like a couple of people who are like on the crypto community, but also very uh, solid technologically uh -huh. and scientifically like, uh, Naval Ravikant or the Balaji's, you know, if, if you ever heard of like their lectures and stuff, I don't know like if they would be helpful or re even reachable for us, but uh, they can actually spear lead like, you know, big projects. So just, just a thought. Yeah, it's a great suggestion. I think Brian's pretty close with both of them. So I can bring them up at our next uh, meeting talking about the board. Those are great suggestions. Uh, Joanna? Yeah, so. I like Edwin and Ricardo and Jeffrey idea about the fact that we should find someone related to the mission. And for example, the research hub is a GitHub for science. And let's say, I'm not sure how many VCs, superstars are interested into directing something that is small scale so far. So maybe we should find someone that is interested in to bringing more people to research hub and like promoting science and the mission of research hub. Yeah. Yeah, so I totally agree. Like there's um an organization that I'm a huge fan of called Spark. Um mm -hmm. and they're kind of like an open science advocacy group. And what they do is basically like put together um, events focused on open science and help to build community around open science. And so there's like their executive director is named Heather Joseph and like uh, she just had like incredible success, like 
building conferences around open science. And so someone like that, I think would be really useful where they're not really like an academic academic, but like their whole career has been spent building open science communities. Um, so that's like a very practical skill for what we need at our current stage. So yeah, that's, that's someone who I, I think could help a lot, like bring new eyes kind of into the equation. Um, someone from Frontiers. Oh, okay, like the journals, Frontier. Yeah, great suggestion. I'll definitely look that up. Uh, yeah, like and someone who like, wants to accelerate what research hub is doing and its uniqueness, because open science projects are everywhere, but like how they can upgrade towards a more decentralized vision and everything that research hub does. Even Malik thinking about the like crypto forward people, like I, I'm gonna pronounce the name wrong, but um Juan Benat, Juan Benet, um, the guy from Protocol Labs, the founder there, I think he's got a PhD in something, would also probably be pretty awesome. Um, I know Brian's friends with him too, so he could potentially reach out. Yeah, so this is something that we're going to be putting together um, kind of one person by one person for the next like six to 12 months. So like if you ever uh, have someone you come across that you're like really excited about and think would be a good addition, uh, feel free to ping me with them. And I'll like take a look and bring them up, you know, in our team meetings and uh, yeah, potentially make it happen. It, so yeah, feel free to hit me up if you guys have any candidates you think would be like super useful. Um, yeah, and so our last topic today is um, kind of in the, the same vein. We want to help increase research hubs, like uh, prestige is the wrong word, but like credibility. And I think one thing that's kind of lacking right now is our about page. Um, it's pretty much been the same for the last two and a half years. Like we haven't updated it at all from like the initial product launch. So um, I kind of want to go hard and make like a really detailed, like, uh, uh, explanation of what research hub is trying to accomplish because i think like selling people on the long-term vision is a big i think that's like a lot of the reason why people are here now is like what could research hub become in the future and so yeah i think focusing on trying to like communicate that vision is pretty important for new people who come to the website and maybe don't fully understand what's going on just from like a first glance um so I was going to take a stab at that this week and we'll like share, um, you know, what I come up with with everybody, but curious if there's any like specific uh, topics that I should cover in this new about page um, that people think are important to bring about. Kind of what I was thinking so far is like describing it in terms of how incentives are broken in academia and how like there are all these like bad downstream consequences and how like a crypto token could use financial incentives to tip the scales in a better direction um, and trying to sell that vision of like we have a token to try and cause better behaviors. I think another exciting thing, I guess, like without just um, like kind of funneling into just the token is um, maybe throw in the terms of other Web3 products that because I think what really got a lot of us excited, I remember this community call a few months ago was when we were discussing the, the promise of like an NFT being used to help bootstrap funding for things. So like those are kind of on the frontier ideas that I think get people really excited about being involved in um, like a project, you know, so I think the, the token is obviously very like pivotal. So I think highlighting that as well is very important. And then the prospect of leveraging NFTs and leveraging these other Web3 technologies. So Jeff, just to repeat that back, you're saying specifically use the term Web3 as like, a, hey, there are a bunch of tools in our tool belt that we could address these issues with. Yeah, I think so, because I think um, people are, are maybe a bit more like kind of apprehensive or hesitant when it comes to like a, a cryptocurrency. But when there's other Web3 tools that are being built around or, and you're, you're telling them, hey, we're not afraid to be leveraging all these exciting new tools. We're not going to just be a normal company with just a token. We're going to be a, a company that's leveraging all these other tools. I think that excites people a little bit. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, 
Totally. And that it describes we're open to like any, you know, way to solve the problems that exist. So it's a it's a great point. Uh Joanna? Yeah, like quantifying what accessible to everyone means. Especially maybe like attracting people from the crypto space, maybe, I don't know. But like how Research Hub has a competitive advantage. For example, I, I asked someone uh, from uh, stores which wants to promote the uh, decentralized clouds about decentralized science, and they were like super excited. And uh, like they were not so aware about what decentralized science means. So maybe just focusing about what decentralized science is and why, what type of people are different than the regular people or something like that. So just to uh, make sure I caught all that, um, you're saying like we should add a section on like, um, what is DSI and why it gives a competitive advantage to DSI projects over Web2 uh, kind of implementations like ResearchGate, academia, standard journals, that kind of thing? Yeah. That's a great suggestion. We can definitely do that. Here's the first question of our interview. Sure. Yeah, I also like, I second what Joanna said. Uh, DSI is getting more and more exposure. So I think it's important that we set the tone that, you know, we're part of like, you know, the decentralized science movement and we're not just a company trying to reinvent the wheel. So it's, I think that's, that's really, really important. Uh, so yeah, having a section on that would be crucial. Okay, cool. Yeah, I can definitely do that. There's like um kind of a phrase that like I've been using to describe some of the stuff. And I think it like if we because it seems like Research Hub is trying to cover the entirety of the science full stack. So it seems like so people like Molecule, for example, are targeting specifically funding and they're just trying to fix this like kind of valley of death part with the funding. But I think one of the things that is a, maybe a selling point for uh, Research Hub. And if you phrase it this way, is to leverage those web tools to um, kind of cover the entire science full stack from funding to collaboration with the ELN and coordination and then, and then publishing. So it's like the entire gamut of everything. So I think that's like kind of appealing because it's like a central location um, that would have those things. And also just allows for more experimentation at each level, which I think there's a lot of value there. Uh, if Because, you know, oftentimes, like, your initial idea for, you know, generating value in any product isn't what you end up with. Uh, but if you have, like, a lot of ways to experiment, that potentially, you know, gives you more opportunities to make your platform more sustainable. Yeah, so I love that, Edwin. That's definitely like, I think like one of the biggest pieces of why, like in my opinion, Research Hub is like more flexible than some of the other DSI projects is just the infrastructure of how we're built. We can experiment quickly. And yeah, I think that's how most tech products end up being successful is you start doing it and then you get feedback and then you iterate and then all of a sudden like you eventually like nail in on like what's actually providing value to people. And it's it's cool to be a part of that process too. Like to be involved in it so i can definitely kind of like explain how we're iterating and you can help you know influence the future of science research research hub is an experiment that we want you to come and be a part of totally yeah and research hub is first of all a hub so you'll find a lot of stuff there <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right yeah and why is good for the scientific research. For example, it increases the health of the research content. And yeah, we should make a little advertising. Maybe. Are you on? I kind of missed that. Can you repeat that? I, I apologize. I right. Yeah, in the sense like directing towards why research helps to me the the health of the uh, scientific research that it's shared on the internet and uh, how research hub 
um, can promote your personal work or like your personal ideas and how the current research is kept um, uh, it's restrained yeah yeah totally like uh, a place to help like gain you know popularity around your own personal theories it's that's a great idea um mark I think and one more thing that uh, it, it's maybe not the most unique, but one of the unique things we have is we have editors for each parts of science that I don't think ResearchGate has or, you know, any other such uh, Web2 based applications have. And I don't even know if any of the DSI uh, platforms have such editors for like specific sciences. So that's a plus we have. Yeah, totally. I was even thinking like, who's the target, like trying to think of like, who are we tailoring this content to? And I think it's like the early career researcher, you know, like late stage PhD. Um, and having like adding a little bit of like, you can earn value, you know, for contributing like scientific knowledge, I think is probably worthwhile. And editor programs like a good example of that. Uh, one kind of unrelated thing I was thinking about, and I'd like to talk to the other law editors about this, but would it be, I mean, this is out there, but would it be possible to make it so people can discuss case law instead of just like law related to technology? Because um, for example, like the stuff going on with Roe v. Wade or, you know, any of these things in the news, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was waving by to Malik because yeah. he had to go. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, I think there might be space uh, for that. I'm not, I'm not sure how, it is research, can be, um, I think there's a, there could be a lot of discussion from a law perspective if people could talk about case law. So. Totally. So it's funny you mentioned that because like one of the first like uh, kind of like product recommendations that was given to me when I started doing this entrepreneurial thing like four or five years ago was uh, Westlaw, like making a Westlaw for scientific research because uh, okay. Westlaw is amazing. Like it's. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, I totally think there's a ton of value there. Like a tokenized less law would be incredible. Um, that, that could be where we end up kind of with the ELN once it gets to full maturity. But I, yeah, discussion of case law would be so cool. Um, I think we should totally get there eventually. Cool. Yeah, so these are- I mean, this, sorry. sorry. Yeah, and this is something that we could also put in there. Maybe it's, it's a bit of a stretch right now, but you know, given that idea that you know once we, grow like I don't know like five ten years kind of like time span those individual hubs could be like develop like independently developing and kind of like creating their own like set of okay. features yeah that would be like super cool like I don't know me in in an engineering discipline I would like to have you know my hub tailored in a way that helps just the biotech people uh while Edwin for example have something similar for uh for low and that could you know, kind of like be you know, not a different product, but, you know, still within research up, kind of like tailoring in a bit that feels more personalized. But that's a bit of a stretch probably right now. I think we should 100% do that eventually. Like, this is a very minimal version, but each subreddit on Reddit, you know, has kind of different rules. Like, maybe you need X comment karma in order to, to post, you know, like, there's all kinds of different, like, cultural, like, features that Reddit helps facilitate. And I think we should do even more than that. Like, each each hub could eventually have like a sub DAO where they do funding through it. Yeah, you know and how those fundings work. Uh, yeah, totally. yeah, could be just you know dependent on that field specifically. Um, but yeah, that is that's like pretty far in the future. So we get there eventually. But I do like uh, communicating that that's the vision, like to give each field the ability to like control their own funding and publishing. Cool. Um, yeah. Any other? Uh, last thoughts here and then i have like one uh question to close things out with cool um yeah so over the next two sprints kind of the next feature that we're uh, going to focus on is the bounties feature in order to start generating some revenue um as an aside also we'll do a, a version two of peer review that has like uh, specific categories people can add their um, like thoughts to within the peer review. But um, with the bounties feature, this is like a super high level question. Um, we don't love the term bounties. It's like, it feels sort of 
like crypto native, even though this isn't totally true, there's bounties even for like local governments and stuff like that. But I, I, I guess like the first question is, do you all think that the term bounties is something that can um, explain the concept of the feature we're building to the grand majority of science? And if not, is there a better term? I, I had like not loved this term um, just because it feels pretty crypto native. It feels like like pirates, you know, like swashbuckling kind of. Um, I don't know why. It just feels like that's that the best way. part. Yeah, <laughs> it might be honestly <laughs> for, like, for researchers totally. But um, I saw like there was like a I was listening to like NPR, um, like a local NPR, and they were saying like some town was now doing bounties for parking tickets. Like if you saw like a a car oh, god i know like it turned turn the people against themselves but, but like yeah they were they they use the term bounty to like cash reward 25 percent of a parking ticket and that's like local government so to me that feels like that's as mainstream as it gets um so yeah just an anecdote that like we don't love it but bounties might actually be the right term and resonate with everybody not sure everything i'm everything else i'm thinking about is pretty awkward you know, like contract or auction or something that takes more explaining than bounty. So, isn't bounty actually coming from the software world, or it's a crypto native term? Like bug bounties? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Bug bounties. I. Yeah, but I'm sure people did bound like non-software based bounties before. I mean, it seems like a pretty old concept, right? It's like Midwestern, like in, you get a you know like a bounty for like catching a, a uh, hooligan. Native American. Like, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like uh, I think what is what I'm I don't really use Kickstarter. What is do you know what kicks like I know it's not really bounties, but it's kind of like kind of funding. I don't know, like maybe it's like you could say like funding request funding or. I think maybe Kobe may have said that, but yeah, maybe like a request funding and or post funding or something like that. Like a a job, even like maybe that's too general. Yeah, I don't know. I'll do a little mini survey, um, like here with some of the people in my lab, just to see if they know what a bounty is. If I said it, and I'll I'll, I'll tell you guys. Yeah, that'd be super interesting to hear, Jeff, because like, I think this all might just be in our heads and bounties are fine. Um, if, if people know what that means, I think that's a good term. I kind of like quests. That reminds me a little bit kind of of Anton's idea. That's so of, like, nerdy, though. Yeah. I mean, that's nerdy. I got that from the rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah, so if anybody like any ideas come up, I think we're gonna stick with bounties because our other the other suggestion that Kobe gave me a task on this call is research coin award. And that's yeah, oh. you know, yeah that's not better than bounties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been thinking about this kind of like in the back of my mind for two or three weeks and nothing has popped up yet. So yeah. But I think bounty's fine though. I, I I literally didn't consider it before you brought this up. Did anybody else think about this before? Uh, we can, we can we can put up a bounty to find a new name for the bounty. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can like specify open bounty, like the type of bounty, research bounty, open bounty, peer review bounty, something like that. Yeah, it's, it seems like bounties is are is going to be the winner here. But yeah, I guess just keeping an open mind in case anything else better kind of comes across our path. Cool. Yeah, so that's all I had for the agenda. Um, does anybody else have any thoughts, questions, last couple of minutes here before we close out? Great. Well, thanks everybody uh, for attending. And then for anyone listening to just uh, plugging the tokenomics sheet again, uh, we'll have another call next Monday at, I believe, 8 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. And we'll end up like discussing uh, all of these tokenomic features and refining the list down to like our favorite top one or two, which will then uh, end up like running past a like tokenomics expert in order to like really have a plan for something that could work long term. 
Um, so yeah, that will be posted uh, under the video in both the, uh, Discord and Slack. But yeah, thanks for everybody for attending all the thoughts. Um, see you next week. See you next week. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye guys.